turning back. You and I know this is a false choice. No living in the past. It's time to pass. It has fueled jobs and entire industries. Seize the moment, it's happening oh so fast. It has improved our lives, advanced our societies. Look, you already know that burning fossil fuels adds carbon dioxide, CO2, into the atmosphere, right? In the past 200 years, we've caused it to rise from 280 parts per million to 400 parts per million. Why should we care? Because all of the extra CO2 in the atmosphere contributes to climate change and acidification in our oceans. So, to begin to handle the role that vehicles play in CO2 emissions, let's decode things on a smaller scale by using the different CO2 life cycles from two identical cars. One fueled by pure gasoline and the other fueled by pure ethanol. Let's start with the gasoline car. First, we'll need some fuel. Critical question. Critical question. Critical question. Where does oil come from? How is oil formed? Get ready. Crude oil was formed from plankton and algae that used the solar energy of photosynthesis to convert CO2 into stored chemical energy in organic matter. Nope, no dinosaurs in oil. That oil was formed in marine environments hundreds of millions of years ago. So it represents ancient sequestered or trapped carbon. Billions of tons over millions of years. To get it, we need to explore for it, then drill a well deep into the earth. And that requires the energy of burning fossil fuels through combustion. Darn, now we're really going into the CO2 hole. Next, we need to produce it and transport it to a refinery. Yeah, you guessed it. More fossil energy inputs, combustion, and more CO2 into the atmosphere. Any guesses what the refinery runs on? Fossil fuels and electricity generated by burning fossil fuels. Finally, we get our refined gasoline that's transported to the gas station. Okay, you get the idea. We pump it into our car, drive off, and release the final trail of carbon dioxide. Did you notice anything similar between the gasoline we burnt and the life cycles of all the CO2 release in the production processes? They all tapped into ancient sequestered fossil fuel from the ground that was converted into carbon dioxide released into today's atmosphere. If you think about it, it's really a one-way flow of CO2 from stored carbon in the Earth into the atmosphere, where it builds up and is stuck there for a long time. Sustainable? Mm, most scientists don't think so. Now, let's give ethanol a shot. First, we need to prepare a field to plant our corn. Clearing or plowing, we're going to burn some tractor fuel. Plowing also releases some of the carbon stored in the soil's organic matter. Now we plant it, releasing more CO2 from our tractor. So far, it's similar in the CO2 cycle of turning oil into gasoline, as we're adding more CO2 into the environment than we're removing. But now, things are about to change. Instead of using ancient trapped carbon from marine photosynthesis, Growing corn actually removes CO2 from today's atmosphere and is using real-time photosynthesis to produce organic matter. Once it's grown, the corn grain is harvested, transported, and processed into ethanol. Again, the picture looks similar to the oil refining process, except that our ethanol energy was produced in part from real-time photosynthesis that used CO2 from today's atmosphere and the CO2 released from our car can be reabsorbed right away by the next crop of corn. So the life cycle of that CO2 from ethanol doesn't have a one-way dead-end flow like petroleum. It kind of resembles the water cycle in that it makes a loop. Cool. Solutions. 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 Corn 
grain isn't the only material that can be used to produce biofuels. Any guesses on what else can be used? You'd be surprised at the number of things we can use to produce biofuels. Out here we're growing things like switchgrass, miscanthus, and corn stover. So here we're standing in switchgrass, which is a monoculture, one species. But we like to think about how crops can grow in mixtures or mixed on a landscape to provide ecosystem services like pollination and carbon sequestration that we might not get from just growing the same thing everywhere. How much carbon does this put back into the soil? All crops are able to fix carbon dioxide. That's how they make their above ground structures. They take carbon dioxide and turn it into plant material. Perennial grasses, by their nature, put a lot more carbon below ground than our annual crops. We often talk about prairie grasses or many of these perennial grasses as being part of what we consider an inverted forest. That's to say, we see a lot of biomass, but there's a lot more biomass below ground. We end up, over time, building our soil carbon resources. So in many instances, we see our annual systems losing carbon over time, and the production that they are putting on is above ground in their grain and not below ground in their root systems. Uh, time out. That huge field of corn over there, it looks like it could produce a lot more ethanol than this wispy stuff. What's the deal? You're right, corn can produce a lot more biomass than the switchgrass varieties we're growing here, but we're interested in the net energy balance. And so when we look at yield, but balance it with the amount of energy it took to produce that yield, we find that the perennial grasses do a better job of maximizing that net energy footprint. This is kind of like economics. What you're worried about is the net return on the investment. When we think about these bioenergy systems, we're thinking about the energy intensity and trying to select systems that are less energy intensive. And perennial grasses and perennial grasslands tend to do a better job at optimizing those things than annual grain systems. As you've discovered, these broad definitions of the terms greener and sustainable really start to come into focus once we think about the fossil energy input and the net CO2 output in the atmosphere from producing different fuels. So, what's going to be the CO2 level in your future atmosphere? Well, that depends on what role you might play as a scientist or engineer in making a difference for our planet Earth. Well, whatever it is, we'll be there right beside you.